This month, we have more news about the silicon shortage, as well as software progress for Core 64, loads of Pine Phone hardware and software news, and significant Pine Time developments leading up to a 1.0 release. There was a lot of people who contributed to this community update, so I would like to thank Lucas, JF, Alex, Lashan, Dalton, Peter, Victor, Conrad, and Brian for help with this community update. Also, if you want more content about open source software and hardware, check out my channel, Pete's Loving Nerd. This is the video version of the community update. This doesn't have as many details as the blog post, but this video will give you the synopsis, so let's get into it. We have some good news about PinePhone and PineBook Pro production. If you don't know already, the PinePhone and PineBook Pro are all up for pre-order. We don't expect any delays in the production or dispatch of either device unless something unforeseen happens during production or dispatch. We expect these to dispatch later this month or in early May. There is also a shipping thread in the forum for those of you who want to stay updated and we look forward to seeing all the newcomers into the community. We also have some silicon shortage updates. We do not expect production circumstances to improve prior to quarter 1 2022, so we have a challenging 8 months ahead of us. However, we will continue with our strategy for taking pre-orders, and as a result, the gaps for pre-order windows are going to be a lot longer than they were last year. However, pre-order windows will be squished, so we expect the time from an order being placed to your device shipping to be reduced. For devices that do not ship in batches like the Pinesol or SO Pine, they will be added to the store when they are physically received from the factory. If you want to stay updated on when things go back in stock, you can join our Telegram news group or follow our Twitter. We are proud to announce that we are donating over 100 OG Pinebook Pros to an established nonprofit. This was met with great enthusiasm by our community, and we are currently in talks with a few candidates for nonprofits. We will make our decision in the coming weeks, and we will keep you updated. Lastly, we are sponsoring this year's Linux App Summit this May. It is a virtual conference co-hosted by the GNOME Foundation and the KDE community. The purpose of Linux App Summit, or LAST for short, is to grow the Linux app ecosystem by bringing people together from the Linux community. This conference offers talks, panels, and Q&A sessions in which attendees share their ideas on how to build a sustainable and competitive Linux app ecosystem. Attendance is free for anyone who registers, and we hope to see you there. For Quartz 64, we have some good news involving Quartz 64 development and the Model B, and some bad news, which we will talk about first. Unfortunately, we learned that the Gigabit Ethernet PHY we intended to use is out of stock with lead times of a year, and an 850% price per unit increase. Because of this, we are going to replace our original Ethernet PHY with a different chip. We are currently looking at our options and collecting opinions from developers. This will delay the launch of the Quartz 64 by around a month or two. By the time next update goes live, we will have a much clearer picture of Quartz 64 Model A production, but for now, stay tuned. Last month we wrote that the Quartz 64 Model B won't be seeing a release anytime soon. Well, a month later, we are now going to show off the Model B and announce that it will be coming out around the same time as the Model A. This is assuming that there is no production delays and the date is subject to change. However, more should be known by the time the next update is ready, so stay tuned for that. Now that we have some insight into the production schedule, let's overview the Model B itself. The board shares the footprint of the ROC64 and has all of its I.O. Those of you who are using the ROC in your current project, this will be a good upgrade board. The engineers even managed to squeeze in more I.O. than the ROC offers with support for DSi, CSi, and an M2 slot. The board also features onboard wireless connectivity with either a Realtek Bluetooth and Wi-Fi chipset or the BL602 from Buffalo, which is the same chip that we are open sourcing the Nutcracker Challenge. We also have schematics for both models of Quartz 64 on our wiki. For software news, we are currently using the development branches of Rockchips repositories. This means using Rockchips 2018 U-Boot and Android Linux kernel 4.19. We are also stuck using the pre-built SPL and Trust binaries from Android on the ROC chip until mainline ATF is released. The boot system has changed significantly from earlier ROC chips generations, and this new system is similar but will require retooling the MK image tool to compensate for the new format. 
So far, U-Boot can boot from microSD cards in the eMMC, although the latter has not been tested. We can load kernels, device trees, and NRD images, and USB LTG also works partially. As for Linux itself, we can currently boot BSP Linux 4.19 as well as mainline Linux. BSP Linux 4.19 boots into the user space and Core I.O. is functional. USB 2.0 works, although it is unstable with long cables, and Serial works through FIQ debugger. As for mainline Linux, we got working clocks, GPIO, microSD, untested eMMC, and the GBE controller. USB 2.0 and 3.0 also works, but USB 2.0 has issues with long cables, and USB 3.0 doesn't function when cables are plugged in, although things like flash drives do work. This is a promising start, but there is still a lot of work to be done. For example, PCIe interrupts are currently broken, and on BSP Linux, PCIe cards are not functional, although they can be detected through polling. The issues with USB 3.0 are possibly related to the issues with USB 2.0, which appears to be a PHY problem. Lastly, Reboot is currently not functional, and everything else is untested as of now. There are still some significant challenges ahead of us, like missing RK3566 documentation that needs work done, and incomplete drivers on mainline Linux. We also need source code for ATF to fix the reboot bug and work out other issues. Alright, we have a huge boatload of PinePhone news, so let's just get into it. Production of PinePhones is currently under control for the foreseeable future, and we have been able to secure three more large production runs this year, despite the component shortages. Given that each pre-order cycle takes approximately two months, we should be covered on PinePhone production until the end of the year. Hopefully by the tail end of the year, the component availability will improve somewhat so we can keep producing pine phones without logistical challenges. The last part of the pine phone keyboard will be back from the factory tomorrow, which means that you won't see the keyboard this update, but there will be a thread on the forum showing it off and more in-depth coverage next update. In other news, we have an update on the fingerprint and wireless charging case as well as the LoRa case. Both cases are shipped off to be manufactured now, which means we will see finished versions of these cases in the nearby future. The fingerprint and wireless charging case is essentially an add-on case for add-ons. For example, it has both a fingerprint scanner and wireless charging module that you can insert into the case. Both of these mentioned modules will already work for the Pine phone, and we will likely ship both modules with the case so you don't have to order them separately. Someone will probably find a way to cram both modules into a single case, but we will not officially support such a combination. As for software news, after the beta image was shipped to the factory, several important changes were made in Plasma Mobile. For example, Angelfish browser now performs a lot better, and there were some user interface changes, such as the sliding panel being opened in two stages now. On the kernel side, the modem is now much more stable, and there's a patch for network manager being developed that makes it easier to connect to mobile data using ofuno based systems like Plasma Mobile and Ubuntu Touch. If you'd like to stay up to date with Plasma Mobile, check out the Plasma Mobile blog and help Plasma Mobile improve by reporting bugs. There has been some sentiment around the community that Ubuntu Touch for the PinePhone is not being worked on, but that is not the truth. Work is being done to update the 5.6 kernel in Ubuntu Touch to Maggie's 5.10 or 5.11 Linux kernel. This has been in the work for months, but we see the light at the end of the tunnel. All of the PinePhone's hardware either works the same or better in Maggie's kernel than it did on the old kernel. Some great improvements with this will be improved network reliability, a hardware accelerated camera viewfinder, and call audio working a lot more reliably. However, there are still some bugs that we need to iron out. For example, once in a while it fails to boot and just sits at the splash screen. This is causing some users to reflash their devices when really you just need to restart your phone to fix it. So, this is not 100% ready just yet. However, if you want to live on the edge, switch to the development or release candidate channels in Ubuntu Touch, and you will be able to help us test out these new features. Work on open sourcing the user space of the modem has led to three milestones these past few weeks, such as better power handling and thermals, as well as a more reliable AT interface and support for GPS. Credit where credit was due, the modem was already well optimized in terms of power consumption. While the modem stays in low power mode when the Pine phone is asleep, it gets out of that mode as soon as the screen is turned on. So, the new user space changes turn the CPU clock speed to 100MHz instead of 400MHz, and this means that 
the modem produces less heat and consumes less power while maintaining the same data transfer speeds. The modem has two ways of communicating with the Pine Phone, the QMI protocol and the AT interface. Primary communication with the modem happens through QMI. However, work needs to be done on the AT interface because user space daemons also need AT commands to adjust some parameters. So, this needs to be done to ensure all different applications receive the responses they're expecting, and to provide additional functionality. At this point, most of the commands only emulate the expected result from factory firmware, but help is being done to re-implement all the needed commands and add some new ones that can be helpful. Conrad has worked on mainlining the PinePhone modem mainline suite, which is a new set of scripts gathered from other community members that allow for quick deployment of the kernel onto the modem. It is non-destructive as the image is only fast boot booted on and not written to the NAND. PMMS provides a set of pre-built binaries including a modified post-market OS RAM disk, so developers can quickly confirm whether or not it works on their devices and play around with the hardware through Telnet. It is still not production grade, but if all goes well, the modem will be able to run the same kernel, if not newer, than the PinePhone itself. Right now, it is only meant to be for development purposes, so if you're a regular user, you probably shouldn't attempt to run this yet, but look forward to the future on this. Alright, now that we've gotten past the jumbo amount of PinePhone news, let's talk about the PineBook Pro and PineTap. We don't have much software news this month, however, if you missed last month, there was a lot of software news for the PineBook Pro there, so check that out. As you may or may not be aware, the PineBook Pro is currently available for pre-order on the Pine Store, with expected shipping occurring this month. Production is currently proceeding well, and unless we encounter unforeseen issues with assembly or dispatch in the next two weeks, Many of you will be receiving your Pinebook Pros around this time next month. Moving forward, however, production of Pinebook Pros looks quite difficult. Many of the components we need to assemble the laptops have either skyrocketed in price or are nowhere to be found. This forces us to monitor and evaluate production viability, and given the current changing market situation, it is very difficult to predict when we will be able to schedule the next production run. It could be as early as two months, or it could take up to a year. There's simply no saying. Moreover, further price increases may occur, although we are aware that this makes the PineBook Pro a much less attractive option. The good news is that the current production run of the PineBook Pro is quite sizable, and there are still many units available. So if you're on the fence about buying a PineBook Pro, or you might want one in the future, we strongly suggest you to get one now. As for PineTap production, we are prioritizing PinePhone production at this time. With very few components available, including the A64 SoC itself, we are opting to produce more PinePhones instead, as that is much more popular than the PineTap is. Furthermore, if we open PineTap pre-orders at this time, the price point would be much higher, which makes it a far less attractive option. That being said, we are going to attempt to seize a window for production this summer, and we will attempt to produce another batch of pine tabs. However, right now it is impossible to tell if we will succeed in securing all the necessary components and negotiate sensible pricing as well as offer the pine tab at an attractive price point. Keep in mind this is an outlook as of today, April 15th, and is subject to change. While the situation may seem less than ideal, it may change any day. The situation is so dynamic that this info could be outdated, even tomorrow, so stay tuned for updates. The activity on the Affinity Time project was quite intense these last couple of weeks. Firstly, we've enabled the motion sensor, which allows for step counting and wake up on wrist rotation, both of which have been long-awaited features in Affinity Time. This is a major milestone, as the motion sensor was the last part of the PineTime hardware that wasn't integrated into AffiniTime yet. We realized quickly that we needed to make a way to disable wake up on wrist rotation, and well, Dequim has, sorry I'm butchering that name, has contributed to these functionalities and a lot more. With a big pull request called Big Rewrite, this is a major rewrite of the UI, with loads of functionality, settings, and apps added. Some of the biggest changes is visual changes and improvements, new UI navigation, a new quick action menu, a bunch of extra settings, tap or double tap to wake or wrist rotation wake, and the settings 
are now saved in flash memory, which means that they do not reset after a reboot. Companion app developers were also busy these past few weeks. Siguo now supports multiple devices and also supports over-the-air updates and a quick deploy mode, which allows you to query GitHub releases and download a release all from one app. There is also another new app called Pinetime Flasher, a GUI app to help flash firmware into Pinetime on Windows using Open OCD. It's written in Python using PyQt5. Last but not least, WaspOS has seen some interesting development with new pull requests including a new screen timeout setting, weather application, a new phone application for showing incoming calls, a new word clock application, and Wasp tool being able to read battery levels. It is safe to say that the Pine Soul has reached an unprecedented level of success. No matter how many reproduce, which is a lot of them, they immediately get snatched up. In terms of volume of units sold per day, the Pine Soul is second only to the SO Pine, and that is an industry oriented device where orders frequently range in the 10,000s. To end this, we'll strive to produce large batches of Pine Soul at regular intervals as long as the components are available. The next batch of Pine Cell should be available any day, and you might be glad to hear that a number of cool accessories will be available at the checkout this time around. Those of you that visited the Pine Store on April Fool's Day, may have been amused to find the Thor's Hammer hammerhead tip for the Pine Soul. This was obviously an April Fool's joke, however an actual Pine Soul hammerhead has been in the works for some time and will be available for purchase soon. The accessory offers a large surface area capable of heating a sizable area of a PCB. The function of the hammerhead is desoldering surface mounted PCB components, but I can imagine it also being used for a number of other applications. There isn't an ETA yet, but it should find its way to the Pine Store later this month. There will also be a new transparent Pine Soul case, which will be available once the production run becomes available for purchase. Many people have been requesting a transparent case for a while, and we finally made it happen. However, we aren't sure if this is going to be a permanent addition to the store, so if you want one, get it now. Lastly, we will offer a thermal isolation mat and a high-quality heat-resistant USB-C power cable, capable of delivering 4 amps of power. The mat and cable are both capable of withstanding exposure to a temperature of 350 degrees Celsius, and we think that both are great accessories for anyone doing a substantial amount of soldering with their pine sole. Cable is made completely to our spec, and to our knowledge it is the first cable of such heat resistance on the market. We don't know when these items will be available on the pine store, but it should be available soon after this video comes out. As mentioned in the February update, as we've been alluding to for nearly six months, Pine64 is very interested in using LoRa and LoRaWAN for connectivity in our products. If you are interested in LoRa and you haven't read February's community update yet, we highly recommend you to do so as we went into our future plans involving LoRa. We plan on executing these plans in the next six months, and as things start taking shape, we will keep you updated more, so stay tuned if you are interested in LoRa. There are other parties involved other than ourselves, so as much as we'd like to explain everything outright, we would like to consider others involved too. Here is a picture of an open Pine64 indoors LoRa gateway. Before moving on to discussing what's actually in the picture, let's first mention that there will be an outdoors version available in aluminum that's rugged and has a water resistant case. As a base for the gateway, we will use a Pine64 A64 LTS SBC fitted with a purpose built hat with a LoRa module. If you are a LoRa aficionado, you will be happy to hear that the chosen chipset is the modern SX1302, which has increased range and speed over its predecessors. This model is able to interface with the SBC through the SPI interface, and as you can tell from the picture, we have two leads to the outside of the casing for LoRa and GPS. Over the past month, we have built a handful of these prototype LoRa gateways and shipped them to developers with an interest in the field of communications. While they work on getting the gateways working, we will be turning our attention to the end nodes. We already mentioned the LoRa back case for the PinePhone, but we are also working on a standalone USB dongle end node adapter, and a PineTab adapter using the SPI module, which can be configured as a USB LoRa dongle. We will also release a LoRa stick powered by a single 18650 battery, and we plan on using the BL602 RISC-V Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module that is currently being open sourced in the Netcracker challenge. 
And it also can be fitted with GPS and we will have a low powered OLED display and additional sensors. All of these end nodes will be using the SX1262. But this is just the beginning. We've got more LoRa related products in the pipeline. In the meantime, check out this video from Privacy and Tech Tips who made an overview of one of the kits Pine sent to them. We also have a Pine64 LoRa chat coming up on Discord, Telegram, and Matrix, which should be added at the time this community update goes live or shortly afterwards. Anyways, that's our show for this month, and have a good life.